So I, I will start uh, with the lecture. Uh, warm welcome to everybody. Uh, in this webinar, <coughs> we will discuss about some aspects of uh, non nodular thyroid diseases. Uh, so, in this short summary, one moment, please. Okay, so uh, in this short uh, summary, I highlight some aspects of the ultrasound of lymphocytic thyroiditis and then I will tell some considerations about subacute thyroiditis. This lecture does not replace the learning of the material about the three kinds of non-nodular thyroid diseases. So at the very beginning, it is worth talking about why ultrasound should be performed at all in the case of lymphocytic thyroiditis. In fact, the study should not be performed for all lymphocytic thyroid patients. Those with a newly diagnosed hypothyroidism and a non-palpable thyroid are unlikely to get handicapped if they miss an ultrasound scan. Moreover, the performance of the study frequently causes unnecessary further differential diagnostic problems. There are basically two reasons why it's still worthwhile to do this for all patients. One is that it is simply appropriate for a patient appearing for a thyroid order to clarify both types of thyroid problems, those related to structure and enlargement, and those related to function. The reason includes an argument that seems very compelling, and this is a common association between lymphocytic thyroiditis and papillary cancer. The other is that the patient being examined today will most likely have an imaging test that also depicts the thyroid gland during his or her lifetime. The patient is better off if ultrasound is done on an endocrine order. There can never be a better time to get a fair opinion in difficult to interpret patterns. This is because all the necessary data are available during the clinical examination, while later in a CT or carotid Doppler examination, the radiologist necessarily has significantly less information. And as we will see, in contrast to the nodular goiter, in the case of lymphocytic thyroiditis, the anamnesis, laboratory da data, and not infrequently the results of the follow-up examination must be taken into account for a correct interpretation. And we have been already in the discussion of the first topic, the way of recognition of lymphocytic thyroiditis. It is worth realizing the difference whether a patient is examined in the radiology or in the endocrine unit. In most of the former cases, the diagnosis is made by chance. The patient was referred for other reasons to ultrasound or other imaging study. In contrast with this situation, more than half of the patients harboring lymphocytic thyroiditis are presented with hypothyroidism in the endocrine unit. One comment for the sake of radiologists, except for patients operated on or underwent radioiodine therapy, almost all adult patients with hypothyroidism have lymphocytic thyroiditis. The second difference is in the opportunities in the two different medical units. Although we have learned from Gilles Ross, Ross that uh, uh, even in the radiological unit, it is uh, very uh, good if a radiologist can talk with the patient and can interrogate him or herself, but it is not the case in every uh, uh, radiological unit. In most cases, the radiologist can only rely on the ultrasound presentation. Three more diagnostic tools are always available for the endocrinologist to give a correct diagnosis. He or she can consider the anamnestic data, the results of laboratory tests, and last but not least, he or she also has the special expertise. What is the significance of this in our daily practice? I give here the data of 113 consecutively examined patients who presented in a radiological unit before the clinical examination. First, let's see the discrepant diagnosis. The single healthy patient who was misdiagnosed as having lymphocytic thyroiditis 
was a very obese man with a decreased echogenicity caused not by thyroiditis but technical reasons. Four patients were falsely diagnosed as having nodules. Three had small cystic areas corresponding to dilated microfolicles, while in the fourth patient an infertile vessel was misinterpreted as nodule. Overall, the third of people who turn out to be healthy have a misdiagnosis. Let's see those patients whose final diagnosis was lymphocytic thyroiditis. In six patients, the hypoepigenicity of the thyroid was overlooked. The radiologist is conditioned to recognize potentially cancerous lesions. However, on the one hand, in contrast to breast, significantly much less discrete thyroid lesions share oncological importance. On the other hand, the basic echogenicity has a huge relevance in the thyroid, a feature that many radiologists pays, pay, pays much less attention to. Both in terms of occurrence and clinical importance, the most important discrepancy was the overestimation of discrete lesions of thyroiditis. Be aware that more than half of lymphocytic thyroiditis were missed or misinterpreted by radiologists. All true nodules were recognized by the radiologist, which means a 100% sensitivity. Each of them performed excellently in what they were trained to do, to recognize potentially malignant lesions. On the other hand, less than 50% of thyroiditis were recognized by the radiologist. And finally, the positive predictive value was only 64% for nodules. It means that in more than the third of cases, when the radiologist diagnosed the nodule, was indeed a false diagnosis. And this is the very essence of the most important and most frequent problem faced by the clinician. At least one fifth of all patients entering the thyroid unit comes with false diagnosis, and many of them also require psychological care to resolve their unnecessary anxiety. The effort spent on this cannot and should not be saved, but at the same time, it takes extra time. Now turn to the next topic, to the ultrasound presentations of lymphocytic thyroiditis. Basically, the hypochogenicity is the hallmark of autoimmune thyroid diseases, particularly lymphocytic thyroiditis. Diffuse hypochogenicity is observed in half to two-thirds of cases. The more pathognomonic presentation is the focal form, which can be found in more than 90% of cases. It is worth mentioning the three special forms. Although these can be included into one of the former categories, the special appearance is worth highlighting. These are the so-called honeycombing pattern, the micronodular form. The third is a less frequently mentioned and occurring subtype, which is characterized by a central large hyperthetic field surrounded with abnormal rim. Let's look at these in the more detail. Diffuse hypogogenicity is the most well-known form of lymphocytic thyroiditis, surely among radiologists. However, this is not the most frequent presentation. The degree of hypogogenicity varies, and this is in relation to the severity of the thyroiditis. Let's see some examples. <clears throat> the left upper image came from a healthy patient. This is an econormal right lobe with a grayscale value of around 90. I remind you that the pixel intensity varies from 0 to 255, darker the structure, lower the value, and conversely, lighter the structure, higher the value. The three other patients had lymphocytic thyroiditis and presented with diffuse hypochogenicity. The left lower patient had a minimally hypoechoic thyroid, the right upper had a moderately hypoechoic one. In both of them, the thyroid was lighter than the strap muscle running ventral to the lobe. The right lower image came from a patient who presented with deeply hypoechoic thyroid, which had a grayscale value lower than the strap muscle. An experienced examiner has no problem describing the images of the right as a hypothetic pattern. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, the distinction between the left images is a much more difficult task. 
there are two issues regarding the diffuse form of lymphocytic thyroiditis. Both are concerning in those cases where focal lesions are missing. The first is that the thyroid becomes darker with age. Around 25% of patients elder than 70 years present with minimally moderated hypothyroid. We may think that we do not cause a great problem if a mild hypogenicity is not recognized. Such patients are most often new thyroid. However, in some cases, and especially in young women, it may be important to seek to detect mild hypogenicity. In the case of mild hypogenicity, the sensitivity of ATPO is significantly worse compared with advanced cases. We automatically recommend, even for youth thyroid and ATPO negative women in childbearing period, a yearly TSH check and the event of pregnancy at once if we meet hypothyroid thyroid. This will ensure timely detection of hypothyroidism and avoid miscarriage. Before moving forward with the presentations of lymphocytic thyroiditis, I demonstrate now with two examples the importance of the recognition of hypogenicity and the importance of its description on ultrasound re uh, report. Both patients in their early 20s presented with a borderline ultrasound pattern. Their thyroids were abnormal and had several tiny hypocric areas. Both a healthy thyroid and an evolving lymphocytic thyroiditis can present with this pattern. The patients were euthyroid and the ATPO negative. I have suggested yearly TSH check in the event of pregnancy at once. A couple of months later, both patients were referred again for evaluation. The women on the left gave birth two months ago and the question was whether she should continue taking the levothyroxine supplementation set in the fifth week of pregnancy. In contrast, the, women, the woman on the left was sent because she had two miscarriages within six months, the second two weeks earlier in the 11th week of pregnancy. The TSH on the day before abortion was 8.2 milli international unit per liter. Of course, it cannot be said that the luckier woman gave birth to a healthy child because her hypothyroidism was recognized, while the other miscarried because of hypothyroidism not recognized at the time. Of course, it cannot be said, but by no means can it be ruled out. And in this case, the key was the recognition of a minimal degree of hypogenicity that can be recognized usually years or even decades before the onset of hypothyroidism. The second is a more frequent ultrasound appearance, and this is the so-called focal form. Up to 95% of patients present with this. <clears throat> I enlisted the main features of this subtype. I emphasize here that these discrete lesions usually have irregular, labulated or spicurated margins. So not only are they hypochoic, but they also present with irregular borders. It means that most of these lesions would belong to the most suspicious thyroid category in all classification systems if they would be regarded as nodules. The distinction from true nodules and the issues regarding the differentiation belong to another topic. This will be discussed in the advanced section. I give only two examples here. <clears throat> the left case should not cause concern. The thyroid is hyperchoic and has more hyperchoic discrete areas. This is the typical presentation of a lymphocytic thyroiditis. However, if we were to stick to the aforementioned definition of the American Thyroid Association, the only definition on nodule, we would and should have to call these discrete small lesions as nodules. The case on the right is much more problematic. Nevertheless, the shape of the discrete lesions, the multiplicity, clearly stand for being these areas more active foci of thyroiditis than true nodules. The first of the three special forms is the honeycombing presentation. This is characterized by numerous hypochoic islets separated either by connective tissue or echonormal thyroid from each other. The honeycombing is a form 
that has no difficulty in recognizing or separating from the nodule, and it has no oncological importance. The left case is pathognomonic, although in the right case a cystically degenerated thyroid loop seems to be a condition to be considered, however, thorough analysis reveals that these are deeply hypoechoic and not cystic areas. The second special form is the so-called micronodular or pseudonodular or pseudolobular form of lymphocytic thyroiditis. These small nodule-like lesions resemble the former, however, the discrete lesions are frequently large, they range from several millimeters to one or two centimeters. The discrete lesions can frequently differ in echogenicity, however, the echonormal or hyperechoic form is more frequent compared to the usual focal form or to the honeycombing pattern. In contrast to most cases of lymph lymphocytic thyroiditis, the thyroid is usually enlarged. In the left example, the thyroid is quite normal. There are numerous echonormal areas in a hypochoic background. The right case shows an enlarged thyroid. In this patient, not the entire lobe, but only the lower two-thirds is composed of discrete lesions. This right case illustrates the differential diagnostic issue of the micronodular form. It is frequently impossible to decide whether these discrete lesions are pathological nodules or not. Fortunately, the differential diagnostic issue does not involve thyroid cancer in most cases. In contrast with the focal form of thyroiditis, this pattern only rarely causes oncological concern. The last special form is characterized by a central hypochoic field, which is surrounded with echonormal rim. The latter is not always complete. This form usually occurs in patients with long-standing hypothyroidism. The central hypochoic area has a rectangular shape, therefore the borders between the hypochoic and echonormal parts are irregular. The thyroid is usually decreased inside. Two examples. If we see only the transverse, the upper images, it rightly arises that these are hypochoic nodules occupying most of the lobe. The longitudinal scan decides the issue in the right case. Note the infiltrative edges of the hypochoic part and the rectangular shape. This cannot be a true nodule. The left case is a bit more equivocal. But again, the tail-like lower edges here in the image makes a much, like, a much less likely opportunity a nodule. Nevertheless, the distinction from a true nodule is not always possible in the central hypochoic type of lymphocytic thyroiditis. The final part of the presentation focuses on the differential diagnostic issues of lymphocytic thyroiditis. I have mentioned several times we dedicate a separate chapter to discussing the first two problems, the distinction between discrete hyperic lesions of thyroiditis and true nodules, and the distinction between intact parts of the thyroid and true nodules. For the third issue, the differentiation of hyperthyroid states are referred to the material presented on the website. Here are shortly discussed the differentiation between the two forms of thyroiditis and a special concern about cytology. Let's see the next issue, the differentiation between the two forms of thyroiditis. In a typical case, there is no concern about the presence of granulomatous thyroiditis. This has a very unique clinical and laboratory appearance. The patient suffers from unilateral pain in the thyroid region, has fever, and the CRP level is usually very high. In contrast to this, a patient with a typical form of lymphocytic thyroiditis has no or minimal neck complaints, the body temperature and the CRP levels are normal. In a typical case, the ultrasound has only a confirmatory role. Let's see two cases for the sake of comparison. The left patient had a subacute, while the right had a lymphocytic thyroiditis. The thyroid shows the characteristic hypochic area 
with ill-defined borders at the first visit, while the pattern in lymphocytic thyroiditis is characterized by diffuse hypocoagulancy and several discrete, more hyperopic areas. Even more impressive is the comparison of the change. The granulomatous thyroiditis shows an almost complete recovery over nine months, but the pattern of lymphocytic thyroiditis remained unchanged even after seven years. There are two issues. Firstly, the presence of subacute thyroiditis does not exclude the simultaneous presence of lymphocytic thyroiditis. Considering the fact that the autoimmune form of thyroiditis occurs in a proportion of more than 10% in women, we have to reckon with this simultaneity. This is important because it is characteristic of subacute thyroiditis that it heals without a trace and permanently, while nearly half of lymphocytic thyroiditis patients experience dysfunction later. To resolve this issue, it is worth following a patient with subacute thyroiditis until a complete ultrasound recovery, which may require even two years. The second issue is the non-typical presentations of the two types of thyroiditis. Less severe cases of subacute thyroiditis have a very similar clinical pattern to more severe cases of lymphocytic thyroiditis. Tenderness, subfibrility, transient hyperthyroidism are the same features. Fortunately, in the short term, within a few weeks, it doesn't matter much if we can't decide which form it is. In both cases, the administration of a non-steroidal anti-inflammatory and beta-blocking agent as a symptomatic treatment is possible, but there is no point in treating the hyperthyroidism caused by destruction with thyrostatic drug. Moreover, the follow-up of patients almost always decides the differential diagnostic issue. The ultrasound pattern rapidly changes in subacute, while it is stable in lymphocytic thyroiditis. <clears throat> Now I discuss a special problem which affects the cytology. In a typical case, the cytologist has no problem in differentiating lymphocytic thyroiditis from oxyphilic tumor. Although oxyphilic cells are the pivotal in both cases, and these cells can present high degree of nuclear atypia, namely nuclear enlargement, anisonucleosis, and even change in nuclear shape, pleomorphism, an experienced cytopathologist is able to handle these difficulties. However, the concern is that a patient with oxyphilic tumor can have lymphocytic thyroiditis, either diffuse or focal form of it. The other problem is that the smear gained from lymphocytic thyroiditis can almost fully mimic an oxyphilic tumor. It is worth considering what the difference is if we have operated on a patient with benign adenoma unnecessarily or if we have operated on a patient who has only Hashimoto's thyroiditis. In the first case, it is questionable whether one had surgery at all unnecessarily since to the best of our knowledge, the criteria that can be examined only after surgery differentiate follicular adenoma from follicular cancer. The other situation is much more problematic. We send the patient to surgery on suspicion of malignancy, who turns out to have not even had a nodule. In addition to, to operate the patient having thyroiditis is technically more difficult compared with a patient who has no thyroiditis. In the advanced section, I will present some examples which demonstrate the potential of a combined cytosonographic approach in order to minimize the diagnostic failures. The point is this. Most oxyphilic cancer is variant of either a follicular cancer or a papillary cancer. If neither the cytology raises the suspicion of papillary cancer, nor the ultrasound raises the suspicion of follicular cancer, then the likelihood of malignancy is minimal. Using this consideration, a substantial number, up to 30% of patients presenting with cytological suspicion of oxyphilic tumor, can avoid surgery, or at least we can offer a wait-and-see approach instead of immediate surgery. <clears throat> Finally, some considerations about subacute thyroiditis. For a detailed description of the ultrasound presentation and related issues, 
I refer to the material on the styrocyte.com. So first about the occurrence of subacute thyroiditis. It occurred in around 10% of our patients first ever referred for thyroid investigation. The incidence is similar to that of thyroid cancers. If we compare the prevalence of subacute to lymphocytic thyroiditis, the ratio is around 1 to 25. This difference is even higher if we would encounter not only first ever examine, but even follow-up examinations. This and the upcoming tables compare two 10-year periods based on our own experience. There is a small difference in the ultrasound presentation between the two periods. However, there is a significant change in the clinical appearance of subacute thyroiditis over the last 15 years, which is caused by the more frequent use of thyroid ultrasound and therefore the more frequently occurring symptomless cases. This tendency is clear regarding the patient complaints, including neck discomfort and pain, and elevated body temperature. The proportion of patients with less typical complaints became significantly higher in the second 10-year period. The comparison of laboratory tests revealed a similar tendency. For example, C patients with normal CRP level in the two different periods. What is the problem with this change? The issue is that the correct interpretation of ultrasound in subacute thyroiditis involves laboratory and clinical data. And as it has been proved, we can much less rely on clinical and laboratory data in the event of subacute thyroiditis over the last decades. I present here only two cases demonstrating the main problem. The ultrasound presentation of subacute thyroiditis is close to that of papillary cancer. There is a striking similarity between the two cases. Both patients presented with a hyperquick lesion with partly lobulated, partly blurred borders. The left case proved to be subacute thyroiditis, while the right did papillary cancer. If we could not rely on clinical data, the differentiation on ultrasound pattern would be impossible in these patients. Thank you very much for your... And I ask you whether anyone has questions. Please unmute yourself. Does anybody has questions or comments? Nobody. Everybody, everything was clear. No comments. Okay. If I may, just a short okay. comment. Uh, yes. In France, recently, we're not allowed anymore to perform uh, a U.S. examination in a case of uh, suspicion of uh, lymphocytic thyroiditis, thyroiditis or hypothyroidism. It's not allowed anymore. Uh, because the, the authorities judge that it is unnecessary. Okay, but what if a patient uh, uh, will have an ultrasound uh, by chance and find, find a lymphocytic thyroiditis? Uh, and and no, I, I, okay. in, in Hungary, uh, we see that patients await ultrasound if they are examined uh, for thyroid diseases, both uh, for uh, non-nodular forms. 
well, if it's by chance, it's it's another subject. But uh, in France, it's still allowed if there is a, a palpatory abnormality. If you if there is a suspicion of goiter, if there is a suspicion of nodule, but if there is something else, not only uh, an elevated TSH or positive TPO antibodies, this would not justify anymore since uh, three months the authorities have decided that we were not allowed to perform it anymore in the, generals, the general uh, case. Okay. Okay, you That's state that goes. in France that is not allowed. Uh, in Hungary, it is a witness for the patients to perform ultrasound uh, if uh, he or she has uh, any uh, kind of thyroid disease. In other countries, I ask you, uh, participants in other countries, uh, you are from several more other countries, what, what is your practice in your country? May I give information? Yes. It's I'm I'm from Turkey. I can give uh, information in Turkey about Turkey. It's uh, in our country thyroid ultrasonography is performed by both uh, endocrinologists and um, if it is ordered by any uh, department it's done in the radiology unit. So endocrinologists uh, has been struggling uh, to uh, get the permission of doing a thyroid ultrasonography. Uh, it was about maybe 20 years ago and uh, they got the permission for that. But uh, we don't charge the patient some some doctors in private practice may charge, but in many hospitals, we don't charge the patient for ultrasonography. We just do it for ourselves to have more knowledge about the patient. Uh, of course, it is extremely useful uh, to follow a thyroiditis patient or a Graves patient or a nodule by yourself, it's very important. The radiology uh, unit, uh, if it is done there, it is, it is not the same. And in some uh, hospitals, uh, radiology department has a huge patient demand. So uh, they cannot uh, spend enough time for a thyroid ultrasonography. Some patients have 10 nodules maybe. They don't write all of them down. But if I do it myself, I have a long note about the patient regarding the nodules and it prevents unnecessary biopsies. It is, uh, I think it's very good for the patient. So there is no restriction at the moment for us. It is not under control. Uh, the only thing is the time limitation, I may say. Uh, some endocrinologists, although they know how to do it, cannot do it because of uh, the huge patient demand in the hospital. But uh, for myself, I can. I have been doing it since years, and I'm very happy with that. Thank you. Okay, but the question is, uh, thank you very much for your comment. Uh, would it be necessary to perform uh, thyroid ultrasound in patients without patient abnormality or not? Uh, I uh, refer to the American guideline. Uh, no one guidelines uh, take uh, stand either for or against the use of, use of ultrasound in hypothyroid or hyperthyroid patients. But uh, in the American guidelines, we can read that uh, more than 90% of American endocrinologists perform ultrasound in the case of Graves' disease. Uh, uh, the, uh, I did not read any, uh, read, did not read uh, any data about uh, the performance of ultrasound in lymphocytic thyroiditis patients. But in America, uh, 
nine, more than 90% of endocrinologists uh, perform in Graves disease uh, ultrasound. So uh, I, I would be very glad uh, if it would be forbidden uh, to perform ultrasound in patients without palpation abnormality because I'm uh, convinced that it causes more harm than benefit. But uh, in Hungary, the, the status is that uh, a patient will find a radiologist or an endo endocrinologist if she won't uh, underwent uh, on uh, thyroid ultrasound, even if she or uh, he has a simple hypothyroidism. Any other comments? So may I ask a question? Please. Please. So w w uh, what is the reason you are thinking that it is more harmful to the patient? Uh, it, it's not good to do an ultrasonography in case of lymphocytic thyroiditis? The most uh, important data is that uh, more than 90% of patients with lymphocytic thyroiditis have a focal form, and it is very frequently misinterpreted as a, a true nodule. And in fact, uh, as I will present in the uh, case studies, uh, it is not always impossible uh, to dis discriminate between a true nodule and the more active foci of thyroiditis. And moreover, we uh, must be aware of a very important fact that uh, a non palpable thyroid cancer is almost always a papillary form. And if it is non palpable, it is a very rare situation that we could cause any harm if we do not recognize. Yeah, I, I got your point. Thank okay. you. But uh, by the way, I perform. All, uh, in all patients entering my uh, thyroid patient unit first time, uh, a thyroid ultrasound. So uh, it is a contradictional situation. Uh, but as I uh, uh, said in the presentation, uh, I mean that it is best, but better to perform a thyroid ultrasound by an expert uh, than uh, by uh, uh, not uh, such uh, kind of expert. Other questions? Comments? Tomás, may I ask you how, Please. how often would you recommend uh, to redo or um, a thyroid ultrasound in a, in a normal, easy-going uh, Hashimoto's patient? So, I mean, once a year or, or every, every five year? No, I, I think that it has no reason. Uh, the question is whether we should perform uh, even one time uh, thyroid ultrasound. If uh, she or uh, he has no uh, suspicious lesions, I, I don't think that uh, uh, it has uh, much sense uh, to repeat uh, the ultrasound. The problem Although is that, that in, in, a lot of patients are afraid of having a thyroid nodule or forming a ty thyroid nodule later on because they are just Google it and they will uh, see that it um, could be a suspicion for a thyroid cancer and all that stuff. So I, I always try to convince them not to do it anymore. Mm -hmm. uh, but sometimes we just manage it in these cases that the, the patient wants to have another one. Uh, Eva, who uh, asked this question, is a... Uh, uh, high uh, expert in Hungary, and we have the similar problem uh, that uh, uh, Hungary is not a country uh, in which the patients uh, uh, follow the rules. So the internet has an extremely great uh, uh, impact uh, on our everyday professional uh, 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 performance. So uh, we have to uh, deal with this problem, and and uh, one of the uh, greatest uh, problem is the use of ultrasound uh, and the awareness of the patients uh, for use this. So, but for for a professional uh, aspect, if a patient has a nodule, naturally it is uh, irrespective whether he or she has uh, by chance uh, Hashimoto's or has not. In a nodular goiter patients, we have to perform follow up examinations. But I have. I'm not aware of any data 
that Hashimoto's thyroid arthritis uh, is uh, 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 makes uh, nodular goiter more frequently later in the course. I, I think uh, it, it, it is not, not, not a real uh, problem. Other? Okay, if not, I will stop the first part of the video recording.